in uh, Rangatira in uh, Iwi Henakoto Katoa, Ko Ross Ihaka Tene, Ko Tararua Te Maunga, Ko Rua Mahara Te Awa, Ko Natikahalami Ki Wangarapa Te Iwi, Ko Ngatiwa Ngatimoe Te Hapu, Ko Papawai Te Wharu Tupuna, Norena, Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, katoa. Um, so I've just acknowledged my Māori connection. Uh, to the south part of the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, that of course is not the whole story, so let me acknowledge my Pākehā side as well. Um, so I have a connection to the Malashans on my mother's side who were among the founding fathers of Dunedin. Um, and on my father's side, um, he, he was descended from the bakers who were early settlers in the Masterton area. Um, so many women on the line. With a little bit of trepidation that I come to talk in front of people who actually know something about computer science. Uh, but I will do my best. Uh, let me say, I am a statistician. Uh, it's been two weeks since my last data analysis. <laughs> uh, uh, and I am actually a statistician, but I do tend to uh, play around with computers rather a lot. And that isn't actually any surprise because statisticians are really very early adopters of computing technology. Even before there were electronic computers, statisticians were using punch cards and mechanical sorting machines to do census tabulation and that sort of thing. Um, and when electronic computers came along, of course, statisticians leapt on those because they enabled us to actually do some calculations, whereas before we actually haven't been able to do that. Um, this talk is a joint talk with Brendan McCarville, who's a PhD student of mine, who is actually doing some work on a new language that we are beginning to play with and think about, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. Um, I did actually want to bring Brendan along so he could give part of the talk, but unfortunately he doesn't do daytime. Uh, <laughs> we, we schedule our meetings at 5 p.m., um, which is the earliest he can possibly make it, make it in, and he's often late for that. Uh, so there wasn't much hope that he was going to be late. Um, here's what I wrote down as an outline of this talk. Uh, I have to say I just read some stuff on the slides, and I'm kind of planning to vague and follow that, but I'll extemporize if necessary, and probably anyway. Um, I want to talk a little bit about exactly what in statistical software and what makes it different from other kinds of software. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about history, um, and by history I mean going back to the 60s, which is about as far back as I go. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the development of R. I know I've, I've been here before on another Kingington day and talked about R. So I guess I've become one of the usual suspects for these talks. Uh, so that, that, that'll be fairly short. Um, and then more particularly about why R is enough. You know, R has kind of taken off in the past five years or so and gets all kinds of attention. And I've been thinking for 10 years, what a load of rubbish. Um, we've got to be able to do better than this. Um, so I'll tell you why I think it's really not that wonderful. Um, and then talk about sort of the, the investigations that we've done on trying to go further and then maybe in slightly different directions. And I've just noticed that uh, my list of uh, bullet points here doesn't actually correspond to the slides, but it's roughly that. Okay, so what is statistical software? I mean, the answer is it's software designed specifically to carry out statistical analysis. Um, well, how does that make it different from any other software that's used to carry out any other thing as well? It's the software I use, I guess. 
Um, the major thing about statistical software is that it's collection oriented. So you never really talk about a single data. It's always a collection of data values. And you tend to handle these things as aggregates and work with them as aggregates. Um, so an awful lot of the software that's developed ignored the idea of scalability models. Um, and that, to some extent, has come back to, to bite us. Um, it's also very strong in its numerical capabilities, so languages that aren't very good with um, numerical things uh, are terribly useful in statistics because it's very numerically intensive in what you do. Um, the other thing is there needs to be at least some symbolic capability there because when you're doing statistics you are looking at models and models are typically some sort of mathematical statement, um, they're not a computational statement. So you need to be able to specify models in some symbolic form and work with them and perhaps manipulate them to some extent. Uh, and of course, if you're actually going to get some work done, you have to have a whole bunch of statistical methodology included in, in this software. Okay, well, you know, you can do statistical analyses in most systems. But another characteristic that's really important is that the software shouldn't intrude on the analysis. Because when you're sitting there doing the analysis, you're concentrating on the data, you're thinking about the models, the last thing you want to have to think about is how do I compute this? What do I need to do in order to get the computation done? You just want it to happen and you want to see the plots and things like that. Um, so, so our motto would be, it's important to think about statistics, not about computing it. Okay, so uh, let's start off with a little bit of history. And these are some of the software systems that developed early on, and by early on I mean early in the 60s, and at that point I was a kid running around barefoot in Rarotonga um, and in Northland. So I didn't actually see a great deal of this until later. Uh, but if you look at these, most of these statistical systems came out of universities or sometimes research institutes. Uh, so the VMD and VMDP series came out of UCLA, um, the health sciences there. OmniTab came out of the National Institute of Standards. It actually was developed by physicists, not by statisticians. Um, SAS came out of North Carolina State University, PSTAT out of the Educational Testing Service at Princeton University, and uh, somewhat later, and that's why I put the space there, GenStat came out of Rothenstein Agricultural Research Station in the UK. Uh, all of these, I believe, were actually developed by statisticians. The real, real computing professionals behind these efforts. But these are what people um, work with. All of these were developed on 32-bit machines, the IBM 360, 370, something like that. Uh, later on, things like control data machines, other machines like that. None of these were interactive, which sounds like a strange thing to say these days, but there was a time when we used to go to the computer center and punch things onto cards and run the cards through a card reader and then wait several hours until you get the results back. Now, that really starts to limit what you're going to do in statistics, because statistics is really an interactive conversation. <coughs> when you try various things, and in response to what you see, you then modify what you're doing and try something else. So it's very much a tight circuit. So these kinds of systems really packaged up a lot of statistical methodology and people would fit their problem into the closest approximation of methodology that was available in these systems. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, late 70s as far as I was concerned, much more interactive computing started to become available. Things like PDP 11s were actually affordable and individual departments could get them. And if you were prepared to stay up late at night, you would get the sole use of these things, and so you could really start to play around with them. Uh, the first interactive system I remember 
encountering was called Glynn, which came out of the Royal Statistical Society. Again, we're talking about statisticians as developers here. Um, and I played that with that a little bit as an undergraduate. Uh, when microcomputers came along, then we got a lot more um, ability to experiment with things, um, particularly when Unix came along. Uh, and I was kind of lucky because I was uh, in Berkeley at about the time that BSD Unix was getting underway. Okay, so <clears throat> there were a lot of PDP levels around to play with because we were getting money from all kinds of people to do these things. Um, the mathematics and statistics <coughs> departments there had actually one of the earliest Unix machines around because Ken Thompson had been visiting and had set up this Unix machine in the department. Nobody really knew how to run it. It was a sort of big manual and it was something that you only knew the big printout manual and page to the right place and follow the instructions there without understanding what was going on and things could sometimes do it again. Um, on the floor of the building I was in, sort of diagonally opposite from my office, there was this guy called Ben Joy, uh, who was a master student one of the founders of uh, some microsystems, I think, and he was the only master's student I've ever seen who had a secretary and a million dollar budget. <laughs> um, so that's how much money was, was sort of floating around for this stuff at that time. Um, because these machines became available, it was possible for students, most particularly students, but also faculty, to start playing with these things and say, can we build interactive systems that we want to play with? Uh, one of the first of these was called ISP, which is Interactive Statistics Package, I guess, um, which was written by undergraduates at Princeton, um, and it was later pushed off to Berkeley, and Harvard had a version as well. Um, there was a system called DART, which kind of evolved from ISP. But more interestingly, um, a system called S was being developed at Bell Labs. Um, the, the big sort of model of the Omnitab devolved into something called Minitab and it was commercialized and it's still around these days. Uh, but really, S was the one that was kind of of interest um, because it was developed by somebody who'd spent a long time thinking about computing. Again, a statistician who started out with a theoretical work in time series. So of all the systems that we really had to play with, S was about the most interesting. And part of the reason it was interesting was because Bell Labs was part of at and and at and had a monopoly on um, the phone system and they weren't allowed to go competitively into computing. So they used to develop a lot of computing products and they would just give them out there. You could get in touch with them and they would send you the source tape and you would have to compile it up and if you had a Unix machine you were in business. Um, running their software. Um, as a result of this sort of free circulation of the software, it became a bit of a standard in the academic world. Um, that may be overstated that there were at least half a dozen universities that we used to develop, but they were Berkeley, Stanford, University of Washington, Seattle, Harvard, um, and a few others. So, some quite important places picked it up and it was a sort of de facto standard in the academic world. Um, ultimately, AT&T was broken up and they decided they were going to make killing in computers and so then the pressure came on them to actually commercialize the things that they previously been given away. And in the late 80s, the S system of the labs got commercialized and we could no longer get source code and that made it a lot less interesting, and of course it was a lot more expensive as well. Um, so towards the end of the 80s, we, we lost access to this. Um, now before we leave the 70s and 80s, I want to talk about hardware constraints. Um, because it had a big effect on the kind of software that we produced. Most of the interactive systems that I played with initially were developed on the PDP-11s. They were 16-bit machines, and that meant you had a 32K address space. Okay, so think about that for a minute. These days we talk in terms of gigabytes of memory, 
and enormously fast processes. But with 32K, I mean, you can get 64 if you separate with the instructions in the data spaces. Um, you actually had to be creative about the program in order to get anything done. And a typical model for this sort of thing was you had a sort of shell program that maintained the conversation with the, the person who was using it, and it would fork off supplementary programs to carry out particular statistical analyses. And these analyses, because they were restricted to 32K, couldn't actually read in a typical data set. And if they were very small, then some prospect could do something. But typically, they would copy bits of the data and you would analyze things piecemeal. Um, so throughout all of this, your data sets resided on disk. You didn't ever actually read the whole thing with the memory you were with them. Um, and each was read at each stage of the analysis into a program to do things with it. Um, and that, I think, got us into a way of thinking which has constrained what's happened since then. Okay, so in small machines, it's natural to hold the data out there on the disk and to copy into the memory as you need it. Okay. And that means you get into the habit of thinking in terms of copying. Okay. There are a number of systems out there that do this. If you've ever played with the SAS system, if you're a statistician, you may have done that. SAS keeps all its data out there and it streams it through and it uses updating algorithms so it's only handling one, handling one observation at a time. Um, older versions of S kept its data and its functions out there on disk, and it also kept the evaluation stack there on disk. So as the computation went along, you would produce some answer, push it out on the stack, so it'd be written out to disk. Um, so you get to thinking in terms of making copies of things. And that's something that's kind of stayed the semantics of statistical systems. Okay, so I'm going to talk about R, and R was kind of modeled on S in sense. Um, so we should maybe think a little bit about what S looks like. Um, it's an imperative expression-based language, so you type expressions and press enter, and the computation happens, and the results are printed. So it's a record-type system. Um, it's implemented as a tree-walking interpreter, and so that means it's slow, but it's also extremely dynamic. You can do some very interesting things um, with it. Uh, the data structures are aggregate type structures. So there are no scales, there are atomic vectors and arrays and what they lists, but they're really generic vectors, and everything is built up out of those. Um, it was invented at Bell Labs, so you can imagine it's like all of those little languages that were developed in Bell Labs in the late 70s or the 80s. Uh, here's an example of the syntax. So this is given a singular value decomposition of a matrix, and you gather the results from that in here. Then we've got lists, vectors, arrays, so this has to be a list because it's got multiple components in it. The dollar operator provides access to named components of that list. And so this is calculating the prediction number based on the serial value prediction. And this is typically what S programs look like. Because it's come from this world where everything has been copied all the time, it has passed by value semantics. Now, that's an illusion. It's a copy of modified, so if you pass an array into a function, it's not actually copy unless you actually modify it. Um, the other thing is that functions are first class and they can be passed around as arguments, and you can return functions as values of functions. Uh, the scoping in S is what sort of interested me initially because I was telling somebody I just found out about closures and how interesting they were in Scheme and I wanted to show them and I didn't have a Scheme interpreter on the machine we were sitting at so I tried it in S 
uh, tried to go to closure and it didn't work, uh, which was rather puzzling. And that's because the scoping rules, the scoping rules say, first look globally for things, oh, sorry, first look locally, and then look globally. So there are no intervening possibilities. There are only those two possibilities. Um, this is defined to be used interactively for doing interactive statistical analyses. So there are no declarations. Variables are created by a solvent. Okay? And the typical thing is that you assign to a, when you do an assignment, it creates a local variable. Um, so there are no closures here. You can't close over the scope that you are embedded in. You only have your local variables and global ones. On the plus side, that makes it easy to serialize functions. And so you can keep all your functions out there on the disk. You don't have to worry about shared state or static variables or anything like that. <coughs> um, on the minus side, this kind of scoping is actually pretty confusing. Uh, because you try and do things that you think will work, and they don't. And here's my prototypical example of that. And so here we are defining the function. The dot, dot, dots are just, this is unimportant stuff. So in the function declaration, there are some arguments there, um, and there are things that embody these functions. So here we have an outer function, and nested within that, there are two functions, f1 and f2. And this is the sort of thing that we would do in Algol or Pascal or something like that. Uh, and it's quite natural. But what's different here is that f2 in the body cannot call f1. f2 cannot see f1 because it can see what's local here. I can see what's global there, we can't see that. And people got extremely puzzled by this kind of scope. Um, it also leads to a style of programming that's very flat. So you have lots and lots of functions at the global level, and you can't hide anything there. <coughs> So this was part of our motivation for having a look at the possibilities for doing things in um, And so I guess it was very early 90s, I can't remember exactly, it might be 91, 92. Um, we had somebody in Auckland who was visiting from Canada and we bumped into each other in the corridor quite literally. Um, and he said, let's write some software. And so there wasn't a deep question that we had in mind we think we could answer. It was just, let's do something in front of it. Um, but to give it some shape, we posed a couple of questions to ourselves. First of all, how easy is it to actually write these systems? We've both been using some of these systems for a while, and I've had a bit of a go at implementing some stuff. Um, my interest was in the scoping, so if we switch to lexical scoping, that is, you know, where you actually see the variables of the scope that you are listed within, um, what would change? And we were both concerned about the fact that the memory management system, I guess, was grateful, it was kind of based on Malloc, and it was um, allocate things, allocate things, allocate things, until you saw the top level prompt, and then you recovered it. Okay, so if you were running a loop or something iterative, you just built up enormous amounts of garbage where you've got people kind of moving back from that. And so the advice that I'd seen on this newfangled thing called the internet said, if you're going to write a language-based system, you should start with this. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with some half-assed implementation of this. This wants you to actually add all the features that you need to the language. So that's where we started. And what we do, did was to steal a little Steam implementation from a book by a guy called Kamen and started beefing that up, adding sort of better memory management to those. And 
you know, we felt after a while that we actually had the basis of something we could actually use. Um, now, if you're somebody who teaches, then your initial reaction is, I'm a teacher, I have this thing, I should put these two things together. And so we should think about teaching a class with this. And I don't know if you know any first year statistics students, but the chance that they're going to swallow this syntax is about zero. Um, so we needed a syntax that we were going to put on this thing. Um, so the one that we had handy was the one that we were both used to using because it had been in this free system that was available to us. And so we lifted the syntax pretty much wholesale out of this. Now we had to make a few changes because we no longer had this local global only, so we sort of adapted our assignments to took place and found variables and things. But the interesting thing was, as soon as we changed the syntax, we got into this game of let's make it look as much like X as possible. Um, and in a way that was being captured by something that was a bit unfortunate. Uh, my initial thought was this, was that this was, let's write a toolkit with which we can write languages and try things out. Uh, and because we got captured, we weren't actually able to do as much experimentation as I would have liked. Um, but the compatibility game was fun to play. I mean, I used to write to John Chambers, and he's the guy who developed this. Um, he actually won the ACM Systems Award for uh, his Software Systems Award for his work on this. So it was you know, kind of a big name of statistical computing. Um, I used to write to him and say, do you really mean this to happen? You know, what were you smoking when you did this <laughs> kind of thing? Fairly impertinent, but he was always actually very polite and very helpful. Um, and uh, clued us into a lot of their thinking behind what they got on this. Now, after we've got a certain amount of compatibility, we noticed that there was actually a lot of software out there that people had written. Um, and there's a place called Statline where people have been depositing software for some time. And in particular, there was a lot of software from the S developers put there as updates for S. And in order for them to do that, they had to get lawyers sign off and put it out there. And now, there wasn't any thought that there was another engine that could be used to run that same software. Uh, but we were able to get that and get large amounts of application software to run in our system. Um, the result of this was that we produced something that was S-like enough for people to be able to run uh, their software on. And a lot of people started expressing interest, but they were nervous about the fact that we might try and take their work and produce some sort of commercial version and then say we make it use of it. Um, at the same time, the um, Free Software Foundation GPL license was kind of in the air and that was really, you know, we've been there for a while, but it was really starting to take off and become visible. So we decided we would put a GPL license on our stuff and just hang out there and see what would happen. Um, so, this is kind of the history of what went on. So we started in Auckland in the early 90s, and as I say, I think this was 91, it was a little bit uh, unstructured because Robert was there on the leave from a place in Canada, and Bucky got a girlfriend in Auckland, and so mm -hmm. he decided to move back a year later, so there were some comings and goings. So it's, it's a bit hard to put an exact date on these things. So we played around with these things for a number of years, um, and we were sort of circulating um, binaries to people. Um, in 1996, we decided we'd had enough of taking the patches that people had been sending us and putting them into the code, and we were trying to understand what they were doing, figuring out why they didn't work. And so we got the people who tested us the most, and we gave them source code access. Um, so they became sort of an informal development group uh, with code access, and people could do the main thing. 
And from that point on, things really started to take off. Um, initially, there were, I think, six people developing. Um, that soon grew to about 12. Um, and in 1999, we actually managed to, so in 97, we managed to get everybody together for the first time to actually talk. Um, and it was kind of fun to sit there in the hotel in Vienna. And people would uh, come in through the door and we'd be sitting there saying, do we know this person? Should we say hello? Uh, because we knew each other by email, but not actually by looking at each other. Um, so there was a very good week in 97 where we spent most of the week in bar um, because that's the important thing in the development. It's not about technical ideas. That can be sorted out by email. It's about trust. And beer is an essential part of building trust, particularly when you're in the um, So we spent a lot of time you know, building trust that week. And um, I think it was at that point somebody suggested that we had a, a version 1.0. We'd been at 0.69 or something like that. And so there was a target. Um, the original target that was set was 9.999. Which we didn't make, and we were kind of keen on keep dates so we could remember them. Um, the other one was February 9, uh, February 29, 2000, um, which shouldn't have existed, but because it was a millennium, it did exist. So if it hadn't been a millennium, it would have uh, not existed. So that seemed like another cute date to, to pick. Uh, since that first release, the, the, exponent, the uh, user base and the developer base has grown exponentially. And the last time I looked, which admittedly is some time ago, there were 4,000 contributing packages. So there's a website like um, CTAN or CTAN or one of those where people just drop off contributions and you can use them or not. Um, it may well be in excess of 5,000. Oh, the problem here is that there's no editorial process. Because it's completely voluntary, uh, there's no control over any quality in these software packages. And most of them are dreadful, uniform. So if you are going to use R and you're going to be able to connect any of these packages, really be careful and try them out and even try them in the source code because there are absolutely no guarantees that the company will come. The only quality check that's made is the program compiles and that the arguments and functions match the description in the uh, type files. There's nothing that says this function actually does what it says it does. OK, so if we look at what we achieved here. R and S both feel about right. They seem to provide about the right ability, the right mix of usability and extensibility. So they don't get in the way when you do data analysis. You can work interactively. Things are just available. You can use them. You can do simple things very easily. You can find new functions on the fly and invoke them. Uh, and if you want to, you can be a little bit more formal and develop some you know, packages of software. The big problem is that it is really, really slow. Um, and a lot of this comes from the fact that it's a, um, a tree wooden interpreter, that's not fast. Uh, more particularly, the fact that we're using call by value semantics means that there is an awful lot of copying that goes on. We tend to be conservative, and so you get a lot more copying than you need to. Um, to tell you about the true horror of this, um, I don't know how many of you know about linear regression, but we essentially set up a an equation that relates a y value to several x values as a linear combination. And as part of the process of actually fitting that model, you create a big matrix and you expand any categorical variables, that sort of any number of types, into dummy variables that specify yes, it's this level or no, it's not. 
So the, the simple set of variables that we start with can expand up into something very large. In the process of actually fitting the model involved in that, seven copies of that matrix get made. Okay. And these days, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a project at the moment that has 65,000 observations and at last count 326 variables. So you can imagine how big these matrices start to get. There's an awful lot of um, dummy variables getting coded in that process as well. So these things get fast, and then you make multiple copies of them. Um, and that means you've got a very big memory footprint. Now, I would have thought people would have noticed that um, and found this thing really slow, but more and more has been going on at such a rate that people just haven't noticed. And think they've been able to handle bigger problems at a sufficiently high rate um, that, that they've been happy to keep using it. Um, the other constraint here is that we're working entirely in terms of aggregates. And so there's no idea that you could carry out an efficient scale of computation other than by coding it in a foreign language like Fortran and C and calling that. And then you've got an abstraction barrier that makes it hard to actually develop these things interactively. You've actually got two sets of development processes that have to go on there. Um, because you can't actually do things in a scalar way, you tend to try to fit things into an aggregate framework. Uh, so you'll try and do matrix computations rather than the obvious scalar computation. And then you're doing things like expanding up the memory involved in this. And now you're in a situation where you get caught by making copies, lots of copies of this thing. Um, and there are some languages that attempt to get around that a bit. So I think about 10 years ago, I think that's about the right time frame, I started thinking there's got to be something better than this. Other people had been making some attempts to do different things, and uh, there's three things that are listed here that people tried. The first of them is translation of R code to C++. So you have sort of well-defined R functions. You can translate those into C or C++, and then hook those into R and call them. Um, the problem here is, is the abstraction barrier. Um, that you invariably get bugs in the program, and now you're on the point of debugging the C++, which is linked to this behemoth, and it's a bit hard to actually get things worked out. Uh, another approach that's been taken is uh, byte compilation. So uh, Luke Turney's been trying to write a byte compiler for, I think, 12 years now. Um, the semantics in R are very much hostile to this. Um, and so all of those things, well, now the other thing is trace compilation. People who have done sort of trace compilation in JavaScript came along and said, oh, we know how to make this thing go fast. And it's uh, five years later, and I'm still waiting. Um, so I think it was harder than they thought it was going to be. So the other possibility is to just stop with R and start to think about, given what we've learned from doing R, what can we do differently? How can we go about doing something? Um, and so that's kind of where I'd actually like my PhD student to come along and start talking about these things. But you'll have to put up with me. <laughs> so this is an indirect um, <coughs> version of what he's been doing. Um, I was constrained very early on by our decision to be compatible. And remember, there were reasons for doing that. There was a whole lot of software that we could get access to. Um, and, and that was actually useful because it got us off the ground pretty quickly. Um, the decision there was that S code should run in R, so we could steal their stuff. But our stuff wouldn't necessarily run in S because we didn't care whether they took our stuff and ran it in their thing or not. Um, 
But this has led us to efficiency problems, and I've mentioned a couple of these. Um, our now, our attitude is that R should get used as an exemplar. So it's the kind of thing that we'd like to have. It's got the right feeling to it, but we don't really want to have that level of compatibility if it's going to constrain us. If it doesn't constrain us, then it's good, but if it does, um, we're not going, to, not going to pursue it because it's going to have a bad effect on us. Now, the bad side of that is that all the application code will have to be rewritten because it makes assumptions about copying and things that uh, we can't actually guarantee. Uh, my thought about this is that given the quality of most of the R code, that's not a bad thing. Okay. We've got what I would regard as a resistance theorem for many things. Now we can go back and actually be a lot more careful and program these things up pretty carefully. Um, and it's not like this is just tail behavior of people who came along much later and um, didn't know or weren't very good at programming or very good at statistics and so did the wrong things. Uh, all the modeling code is based on original modeling code by a professor at Stanford. Uh, and it's just not that good. And, and the programming is clumsy to put it mildly. And what's happened is that everybody since he wrote the initial things has come along and copied it. So this is kind of propagated throughout the whole system. There are very clumsy ways of doing things. So it's going to be a lot of work. But the interesting thing is I think that a project like R, where people are contributing to a free software project, suggests you can get a lot of code written quickly. And you can probably get it written by people who are pretty good at what they do. So, you know, I think it's like 10 years ago, but a while ago, I got this PhD student who had come through computer science and was kind of interested in statistics because his father was one of my colleagues. Um, and he wanted to pursue this, so I tasked him um, with writing a new language to do these kinds of things. Um, so here are basically my instructions. We need to be careful and not discard the good things. And so you'll have to have a look at R and you'll have to see what the good things are. Um, and the primary good things are that the environment is interactive and that's an absolute necessity for doing any kind of statistical analysis because it is this development cycle of try something, see the results, modify what you do, try that, see the results, and you go around in a circle. Uh, the environment's got to support interactive development okay? because um, doing data analysis is interactive programming. You don't know what you're going to do when you start, and you will often have to be rolling pieces of software on the fly as you proceed through that. So we need interactive development, and we want speed. Okay, well, our first thought was, let's look around for a system that gives us this, and the obvious system out there was Commons. Okay, it's an interactive environment, you can um, develop code interactively, and it's got pretty good performance okay, for the kinds of things it does. Okay, so our initial starting point was to take Common Lisp and add statistical functionality. Use one of the compilers and the compiler that we set along as SBCL in the tune because it was about the best one out there. Um, and yeah, things went along for a while, but we found that there were some real issues, particularly around the numerics, okay, because the arithmetic in Common List is very hardwired. So if you have new kinds of things and you want to start finding arithmetic for them, the compiler isn't ready for that. So the option we had was to maybe start hacking the compiler. 
And that didn't seem like a very smart idea. A, because we didn't know that much about list compilers, and if you look at the source code for SPCL, it's kind of a mess in the way that you know, open source or free software is. And so after a bit of thought, um, we decided it would be better to start from scratch. And that's kind of where we've been for a few years now. In the process of thinking about what we wanted to do, we looked at various models, and these are, in some sense, competitors um, in, in the space. Um, so MATLAB is an obvious one. It's a very successful system, commercially based. It's based on manipulating matrices, as the name would suggest. Um, the people who like MATLAB has lately started developing a new language called Julia. Uh, which is a compiled language. Um, it's got lots of features that have been added. And I thought for a while that I was going to go in that direction. But the project smells a little bit funny. Um, so with a lot of free software project, the, the human interaction thing is really important. And the sense I get from Julia is that there are, people, there are people at the heart of it who really want control. They are going to hold on and do things their way. But people seem to come into the project for a while and then just kind of drift off. Now, some of the original art developers have actually gone over there. Um, there are some issues with it because, for example, one of the things that's key in statistical systems is the ability to handle missing data. And so you need missing data indicators, and it's nice if that's built in at a really low level, because to build that over the top of an existing system doesn't actually work that well. And now the, the, the prime developers for Julia don't see it that way. They see themselves as being MATLAB. Thing, and that way doesn't have missing observations. Um, so it's still interesting to watch the development on that, and they're doing some interesting things. Um, that's another thing. It's kind of C ish. It's based on the LLVM compiler um, toolkit, and that is pretty much C. And so you've got to fit into that particular way of doing things. Um, more historically, APL provides some very interesting things to look at in the way of handling arrays, and um, there are other versions of APL. There's one called Meow, which is nested interactive arrays. Um, so it's got some interesting things to say, but it's been around a long time, and if it was going to be the environment we wanted to use, we'd be using it. Um, Scheme, I think, is also kind of interesting, but again, it suffers from the same problem that Commonwealth is that it's not designed to do the things that we want it to do. Um, Dylan, I think, was also pretty interesting. Um, and I thought for a long time that was going to be a big language. At the uh, time I started thinking about these things, it looked like there were, there were two possibilities. There was this thing called um, uh, Dylan, which was coming out of Apple, and it looked like this beautiful, clean, nice language. And then on the other hand, there was this thing from Sun called Oak, um, which looked really ratty and nasty. Um, and then they renamed it Java, and it seemed to take off, which tells you about something that you know about what I know about computer languages. I always pick the wrong one. Um, so we looked at some other things as well. One of the interesting things we looked at was single assignment C, um, which takes a very high level description of aggregate operations and it tries to analyze it down and rewrite the code in a very efficient low level way. Um, and that seems like something you'd really want to be able to do. So if you're a statistician, you want to give this very high level description of what it is you want to do, but you'd like that to happen efficiently. And so that seems really like the kind of thing we'd like to have going on. The problem is single assignment C works really well for the things that it does really well. Um, but it doesn't do everything we like to do. Um, so while it's interesting, um, 
it didn't seem to be what we wanted to do. Um, so choices we made are is it shouldn't feel different from our OS, whatever that means. Um, we want it to be imperative, so uh, as I said, these things are often interactive. You are defining the way things are going to happen as you go through. You don't know what the whole picture is yet. You need to build it up incrementally. Uh, it's got to be compiled because we want that sort of speed. Uh, RNS have a weird idea of using lazy evaluation for function arguments. Uh, and that has some very strange effects. The reason for actually getting them is so that you can get access to the code. Um, I mean, the, the actual interpreted code and treat the code symbolically. And so one way of doing that is to keep the parse tree around as part of the expression being evaluated and then you can always get that symbolic form of it. Um, that has to go. And so we need sort of point of call evaluation for function arguments. Uh, we decided that rather than using anything else, we'd go with call by reference semantics because that's what everything does. And we wanted to have scalar types because we wanted to be able to do arithmetic efficiently down at the scale level. Um, so this is the task I gave Brendan for his PhD, is to write a language that does this sort of stuff. Um, and so he went away, and he's started thinking about this. Um, this, I guess, I've talked about a uh, bit. Um, <coughs> R uses lazy evaluation, we just can't have that. Uh, we need to, we need much more efficiency than we can get from that. Uh, you can get the effect of lazy evaluation with quotation anyway, um, so we don't actually need that. Um, the other thing that R does is it makes use of access to um, environments um, and call frames. And so a function that's operating has a sort of dynamic scope capability that it can work its way back up, looking at variables and the functions that have called it. And that gets made use of a lot. Okay, so we can't have that sort of thing. So we're losing some capability, we're losing some dynamism, um, but hopefully we're going to gain from it. Uh, for declarations, we know we need declarations because you've got to help the compiler out and tell it the types of things because then you can actually make code more specific to that. Uh, but we've taken the idea that this should be optional. So if you are interactively analyzing a data set, you can't afford to have to sit there and think, what's the type of this thing? So it has to be optional. And if you leave out the types, you may pay a price efficiency, okay? but you just go and do that. If you're prepared to actually go in there and do full annotation of the code that you're writing, then you can buy yourself the forms. And that's a useful sort of way to see that means that you know, the code will run in a basic way, but um, you can help it out and make it run a lot faster if you want to. Um, so the typing is optional and it's there as an assertion. Um, so what happens is when you go into a code which has type specified, you can check at the boundary what, um, whether or not the constraint is satisfied. Uh, a change from R is that variable scope will need to be declared. Um, and that's not going to affect anyone working interactively. It is going to affect anyone who is starting to write code. Um, in the type line, we've decided we have to have scalars. Um, in R and other languages, scalars are represented by vectors of length one. Okay, so vectors are a kind of container object, and so that means when you go to get a value, you first of all have to find out where the container is, and you have to open the container, you have to reach in, take the value out, 
when you are putting a value back there, you have to look at the value, put it back inside the container, and do that sort of thing. So there's a lot of overhead uh, associated with that. Um, so we want the scalar types. Um, and at the primitive level, we also want these scalar types to have missing values as part of the type specification. We can use IEEE man values for floating point, but we need them for logical character and um, enumerated types as well. Okay, so what's a progress report on this? Well, this is Brendan's PhD, and I keep saying Archidamiet, Archidamiet, Archidamiet. Um, and he keeps saying, oh, just, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Um, the implementation is there. We actually have end-to-end -end implementation at this point. It's really uh, details uh, that need to be looked at. Um, we're using a syntax which is fairly close to R or S, or in fact many other languages as well. Uh, the code is put through a series of translations um, into static symbol assignment form, and so there are a lot of optimizations available in the literature that you can call on at that point. Um, at the moment, the back end is uh, a bytecode interpreter with some pretty high level operations. Um, but that is really just for getting the thesis done. Uh, the ultimate goal here is to replace that with a real code generator at the back. Um, LLVM is one possibility, but the one we'd really like to go for is the new JIT for GCC. Um, it's only in the most recent release, I think, of GCC, and so it will probably take a while to, um, to mature. Other sorts of things we need to think about is garbage collection, um, the garbage collector in R, the memory management in R, is really pretty good, um, and it has to be, because it is stress tested like you wouldn't believe. So you will probably take some variant of that and use that. So the plan is to actually complete a basic language environment for doing statistics. Okay, the question is, what do you do then? A language by itself isn't actually very useful. You have to be able to do things with it. And so the question is, how do we start to grow a more complete system around it? Okay. Well, my experience in attempting to do these things in an academic environment is nobody's interested. Um, so there's been no appetite to give funding to R or anything like R. In fact, the opposite is true. There's been a lot of interest in taking money out of R. Um, there's a company called Revolution Analytics who, through fairly nefarious means, decided they could actually sell a version of R without delivering all the source code to it, even though it's gpl um, And they were recently bought by a company called Microsoft, and so Microsoft is looking at monetizing R and taking money out of it. And there's been no thought by either of those people about putting money back into this kind of project. So I think that one's kind of off the cards. Uh, you know, my, my experience of applying for grants here is it's just a complete waste of time, so um, let's not bother with that. Um, the other way to go is to try and make use of um, what happened with R. And with R, things kind of grew organically. Um, and this is kind of important because there's no such thing as an expert in statistics. There are lots of experts in small parts of statistics. So the knowledge is really dispersed. And you can't have a single person come in and implement it. In fact, you can't have a team of 20 come in and implement it. And you can't have a team of 100 come in and implement it. Because there's always much more to be done. 
And in fact, I, I heard a quote from commercial statistical software developers saying, how do you guys do it? You know, we have this big team of programmers and we can't keep up with um, how you manage them to do it. And the idea is, you know, you just, you get lots of people to do a small piece and pretty soon you've got a lot of code. It may not be the best code, but you've got a lot of it. So the one possibility is that we try and do exactly what happened with R. And there's a real question about can that happen again? And for a start, do we have sufficient underpinning to do that? Well, we don't know that yet, but maybe we will. Um, but if we build it, will they come? I don't know. So it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be around to really think about that. I'm so inspired by what's happened over the past 20 years of my career that I plan to retire early and go to the beach and go fishing. <laughs> um, so I plan to do that in the next year or two. Maybe there will be a new generation of people who want to pick this up and go on with it. Um, I think I've had about all the fun that I'm going to get out of it. But who knows? Um, so that's about it. It's kind of a statistician's apology for getting involved in computing, and I hope it's given you some flavor of the kind of thing that you're interested in, at least. Developers, our first names were Ross and Robert, so we named it after ourselves. Um, it's also a play on S, but you know, uh, it was a joke. We never thought anybody outside of the department would use it, so it's okay to make that kind of joke. Um, <laughs> if we knew where we'd be now, we probably would have been a little more modest. Can you describe it? So you have an expression like x plus y, right? So that can be represented as plus with an x and a y. And now the x could also be an expression a times b, so you've got a times and an a and a b. Book. So a big mathematical or computational expression can be represented as a tree. The way you evaluate that is you just walk around the tree doing what each of the bits seems to do. Um, I'm going to do a very question with the name for R, the name that you think is You're thinking about that L. Um, a, I think it's important to have something before you give it a name. And I have thought of lots of names, but I'm not the person actually writing the code, and so that really needs to be left up to him. So I was thinking I would like to call it nice for you know new interactive computing environment yeah. or something like that. But it's it's not something I feel I should know. Oh, like recently like in data science and um so this is like five people kind of big thing and I always see you know I want you all this um, yeah, when when we first started thinking about this, we wanted to see how things perform. Python's actually not fast. Um, so if you turn it, if you call alien code, you can make it look fast, but then you're in the same problem as R does. When you run scaling things, it's just not that good. Um, how much money have you got? <laughs> um, you're, ask, you're asking people to work for nothing, and the editorial work is the stuff that people really don't like to do. Well, there's one other, there's the porting to Windows. Uh, nobody likes doing that. Right? And so we've actually found money to pay people to do that. Uh, but, you know, Yeah, so they're, they're the model is the, the benevolent tyrant. Um, I don't know anyone who's going to do it here because I think the scope is much bigger. If you are going to be the editorial person, you have to not 
only know about the computing, but you have to have this huge encyclopedic knowledge of statistics. So at the very least, you need committed. Um, and I'm not sure how you would structure that. Um, when you were developing R, was that like a full-time thing? Or was that sort of just in spare time? <laughs> I ask my ex-wife. <laughs> 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 um, any other questions? Um, I haven't actually looked at it specifically here. Um, I'm not sure that was interactive. I'm not sure that's the right Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a few of these things in that. Yeah. So, presumably that that community, which you're writing, you pointed out that the efficiency is not, it's still relevant to the current way of doing things. Yep. I'm sure you have a presentation from the people who support that, and maybe five thousand managers from there. So, yep. there's a fast and mental. <coughs> what's happening so, right now, I don't know how you draw all these things out, but um, you have know, comments on um, yeah, so there is a huge amount of code out there, and a lot of it's interesting, and we have kind of discussed ways that you could approach that. So one of them is to look at some form of automatic translation from R uh, into this new language. The other option is you could implement R in this new language, and then get these things in that way. Um, so there's various forms of compatibility you could think about. Um, you know, I'm not going to go too far down that road until I know I've got something solid to build on. Um, but yeah, no, we've, we've had a little bit of thought about that. Yeah, but there must be a way to use that for the future. Yeah, and there are companies who are trying to take some money out of that. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, there there is an R Foundation that does get contributions from people. I mean, we can't charge people because it's a GPL software and that's just not going to work that well. Um, and there is a lot of goodwill and there is a small amount of donation. It's not huge. Like in the first, I think, six years we got 30,000 euros, um, which we were able to use to buy time on servers for web stuff and a little bit of programming time. Uh, it's not a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Wikipedia audience is vast compared to the R audience. <coughs> We feel like there are a lot of us, but there really are. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a lot of people there just taking the action against the um, I tried. Um, and what it came down to was that at some point, somebody changed the license on the R header files from GPL2 to LGPL. Um, and that was done without my say so, even though it was my copyright. Um, and so I went to the Free Software Foundation and said, what can we do about that? And they said, essentially nothing, because it will be regarded as a dispute between partners within the R project, and um, we'll, you know, revolution will just walk away if we do anything to do with it. Um, and I have to say, the fact that my R co-creator was on the board of Revolution Analytics <laughs> meant that things really weren't going to go well. And I have to say, it's unlikely we'll talk again. The web was brought up before, I don't know, it's a funny thing. 
you got any plans for this new system to integrate uh, sort of parallelized processing of anything that you need to do? Uh, we're trying not to exclude possible things. So when Robert and I did our, we didn't even think about that side. This time, we are trying to think in terms of preserving the ability to run threads um, to do some sort of multiple processing, to use vectorized capabilities and processes. You know, while that may not actually get built in initially, we're hoping to leave the space there where it could actually be. <laughs> Sorry, I've been here a bit longer. Um, this new language again. So I started off as a small thing that uses Slack stuff on. Um, because as you say, there's you can only fit one small field. Yeah. Is there a particular starting point you're aiming for with this new one? Is it a bare bones does nothing or it, or does the most basic things? Well that yeah. That once you've got the same bones, you've got the ability to do array manipulation. Uh, we would immediately start buying things like LA Pack and other numerical analysis things. And then it's not too hard to actually start building things. We have typical regression programs, 20 lines of code. Um, so it, the classical side of statistics would come along fairly quickly. Now the other thing about a lot of work that's done for R is it's not actually in R. There's a very thin interface in R over C or C++ or C++. Um, and we definitely want the ability to run AD code in this thing. Um, so that would give us access to quite a big chunk of stuff, just rewriting these superficial interfaces. Um, and so that could be a way uh, there's other things to think about, like graphics, for example. You know, that's that's a big thing to redesign and redo. Um, but it would be good to do it. But the, the graphics in R are not all that appear in So there's, a, there's an awful lot of room to modernize that. I have to say, I, I, I stole the graphics directly from S, you know, not, having, not having the S source code at the time, but I did my best job of re-implementing what was there and I saw John Chambers and told him I felt actually a little bit guilty about such a direct steal of what he had done. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> he said he actually stole it from the Fortran subroutine library that was around in the 60s. <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that people say about R is they really like it because of the good graphics. It's <laughs> just <laughs> really old. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we discussed the, I guess, the problems and limitations of R, and we talked about how we were sort of really lost those problems. How long would it take until the R is going to be viable and we start to have some Um It's always going to be viable for the kind of problems it's viable for now. Uh, what it's not viable for are gigantic problems, and it's already not viable for those. Uh, so, so long as you stick with smaller problems, you're fine. Uh, it, but it's really the bigger things. And, you know, with the automatic collection of data these days, there's an awful lot of that stuff out there now. Uh, so depending on which area you're interested in, you're either be there or it's not going to matter. No, and we're hoping not to limit ourselves to that. Uh, so we're hoping to have a streaming model where you can stream stuff through. Um, you can't do everything that way, but there's an awful lot of statistical computation you can do that way. That's what SAS is all about. Um, so again, we're, we're not going to limit ourselves. We're trying to do things as flexible as possible. For later options. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I do get samples from time to time, and then the next release I can see if I don't run anymore. <laughs> 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 uh, 
It's reasonably static, but not completely static. <laughs> Um, Brendan is going to finish his PhD in, in, <laughs> in the next year, and at that point, then yeah, we'll see what's going on. Yeah, of course. One last thing. So, and everyone here would like to thank you uh, with a small token of appreciation. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you.